be talking about vulnerability. So there, there are um, two major points I want to um, say about vulnerability. One is um, when we enroll people who are tending to be vulnerable, we have to give special justifications of why we're enrolling people who are vulnerable. And the most, the most common reason is that we want to study an illness that they have that is actually a cause of their vulnerability. So if one um, reason is that they have a mental illness, it's because we're studying mental illness. If we're studying hypertension, then it's not necessary to enroll people with mental illness. We could roll, uh, in, in, enroll people who does not have that vulnerability. If we want to enroll children, it's because we want to study an illness or a condition that is specific to children. Same thing with prisoners. If we want to enroll prisoners, we want to enroll uh, some condition or illness that is more specific to prisoners. So we need the special justification. And then, and then we have to decide based on the potential risks, uh, additional safeguards, uh, not only to limit the risk, but also to protect, protect their, their rights. So those are the two major things we want to talk about, special justifications and additional safeguards. Okay, so, um, so how do we define vulnerability? What do you think? Anyone want to give it? Give a thought. Uh, can I say? Yes, yes. It's open yeah. for can everyone. When, open when, we, when we classify people um, by their age, physical abilities, mental abilities, uh, economical situation. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't want to, um, don't, rather than give a list of causes of vulnerability, um, I mean, before, you, before one could give a list of what might cause vulnerability, we need, we need a definition of vulnerability. Um, what, maybe, maybe they are, pre, uh, if I can say something, Yes. Uh, maybe there are people uh, like people that are unable to take decision by themselves. Okay. Like they All are. Right. Uh, they have the lack. They lack the the judgments, so they cannot take decision. Okay. All right. That's a that's a good start. Thomas, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I was just going to say the same thing. This would be a group of people who are unable to make informed decisions by themselves uh, would be considered a vulnerable population. Okay, all right, good. So people who can't make decisions, so people with mental illness, children exactly. who can't decide for themselves. Um, so, um, uh, so Galana, you were mentioning, you were giving a whole long list of, of characteristics uh, yes. So you, uh, let's see now. You mentioned economic. Uh, yes, the how, age, how, physical how, how, age. Uh, what what's up with age? Like children. Be careful now. Okay, children are, are more vulnerable in comparison okay, to adults. But 
it, it's um, it's not age specifically. It's it's their cognitive their ability. ability. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, what else did you mention? Economical situation. Okay. So what's up with economic? Uh, like people uh, who um, uh, have um, not, don't have enough income or in a lower level of uh, standard level. So what, uh, why, why does that make someone vulnerable? And because, uh, um, for example, in uh, research, they may choose to put themselves in uh, risk because of inducement or payments received from research, even for a little payment? Um, well, I mean, just because you're poor, does that mean you can't think about the risks? No, but um, maybe the economical situation and, and the pressures are so much that you cannot, uh, you are, uh, you don't, you are not in a stable mind or you don't have enough ability to make, uh, rational decision okay all right okay so we're back to the cognitive concept okay uh what else did you mention on your list elderly and pregnant women elderly yes right? and what's up with being elderly oh what what's your what's your age for that threshold for elderly by the way that's okay you don't have to tell us, <laughs> tell us what you think about that. Um, what's up with pregnant women? Why, why are pregnant women vulnerable? What's up with that? Uh, I'm glad that you said that. And uh, as opposed to a, a male, but what's up with pregnant women? I think because of their uh, condition, that they are uh, not deciding for themselves, but also for someone else. So um, why, and, uh, why is that so difficult? Tell me, mm. I've never been pregnant before, so I don't know. <laughs> me neither. Oh, okay. But I, I, yeah, but I, do, I think do we have any, to anyone it, here no. with children? Any, any, yes, but in comparison to in comparison to someone who is not pregnant, um, I think they are more vulnerable. Really? Okay. And um, can I add a point? Yes. So uh, I believe Gulana is uh, talking about medical vulnerability more than uh, uh, physical um, uh, uh, research participant vulnerability. I believe so. So we we could uh, yes, we are talking in the uh, context of the research, medical point in the context of medical point of view. So pregnant women are more vulnerable to complications, uh, elderly children, but this would not affect the being vulnerable for medical research, right? Right, yeah, right. I, mm. uh, uh, that, that's a good point. They may mm. be uh, more vulnerable to illness, uh, but, uh, but, but you're right, that's more about the, um, the clinic. Now, the fetus mm. is also mm. more vulnerable to medical um, uh, issues, uh, but uh, because of that, we tend not to want to uh, include pregnant women mm -hmm. uh, in research unless the research deals with the state of, of pregnancy. Uh, all right, well, that's that's all a good start. Um, now, uh, there are two senses of vulnerability. Uh, one is that uh, to be exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed. Uh, you know, the original sense of vulnerability came from uh, cities or countries being exposed to the possibility of being attacked. And that's why a lot of cities 
you know, they build forts to protect themselves from being attacked if they felt they were uh, vulnerable to being attacked. And, you know, uh, a lot of early cities being built had forts. They were built inside a fort. Um, and the other sense of vulnerability is liable to succumb to temptation or manipulation. Um, so your here, this, this uh, definition is more, well, this could be an individual if you feel like you're going to walk out late at night. Uh, you may be more vulnerable to being attacked. Here, you may be vulnerable to temptation or manipulation. Uh, the, um, uh, where's my, right. okay. So, uh, now the CIMS guidelines, which by the way is a, uh, an important guideline, just like Helsinki, the uh, Council of the In International Organization of Medical Specialties. And um, so that's an important document. They define vulnerability as vulnerable persons are those who are relatively or absolutely incapable of protecting their own interests. Uh, they may have insufficient power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes to protect their own interests. And hence, if we, again, if we want to enroll these people, we need special justifications and also the means of protecting their rights and welfare. Now, in this slide, another definition of vulnerability, in the context of research, this is what we're talking about, should be understood to be a condition, either intrinsic, meaning like cognitive um, issues, lacking intelligence or the ability to to reason or situational like poverty or, or uh, differences in power um, that puts them at greater risk of being used in ethically inappropriate ways in research. What does that mean, being used? Like abused? Abused? And, and what does that mean? Um, yeah, taking advantage of them. Okay, taking advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how do we take advantage of people? In, uh, forcing them. What's that? Forcing them. Forcing them? Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, to do things uh, against their will. Now, how do we force people to join research? Giving them like wrong information, maybe misleading. Yes, right. Okay, good. All right. Uh, mm. uh, Unclear so information. Okay, right. We could, mm. uh, just like in that informed consent in yellow fever mm -hmm. or mm. the Willowbrook experiment. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mean, essentially, uh, we researchers need people to be in their research, right? So we're, we're using them, okay? Mm. However, however uh, Emmanuel Kant said, never use people merely This is one of the most important words in philosophy, merely. It's not a very long word, okay? Merely as a means, only as a means. 
Immanuel Kant, famous German philosopher in the 19th uh, century, never used people merely as a mean, but as an end into the, uh, unto themselves, meaning that you need to always respect them as a human being. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so now we use people in research for the purposes of advancing science. So how do we not merely use individuals? What do we do to try to respect them? Giving them the right to participate or not? That's right. Yes, we, we ask for their informed consent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, that's uh, uh, and and one of the ethical requirements was respect mm. for enrolled subjects. We mm. uh, monitor their safety, and mm. we give them the ability to to withdraw mm. anytime. Um, so we we need to respect their human dignity. So. Uh, so being vulnerable means they're at greater, greater risk. That's an important point because we're all at some risk of being used. We, we all have different extent of being vulnerable in our lives, but certain people are at greater risk of being used in research, like the mentally ill, like children, people in poverty, people in dependent relationships. Okay, so that that is the concept we want to get a, get across with vulnerability. Okay, so where's the um, ah, okay. So let's uh, all right. So. We actually have a two-part definition of vulnerability. Yeah, okay. So one part, first to be vulnerable, you have to substantially be unable to protect yourself. But then there's an external part. You have to be exposed to the possibility of harm. Okay, so let's say uh, I don't know how to swim very well. So I'm vulnerable. But as long as I, I don't go near water, I'm okay, right? Um, now, people who are unable to protect themselves well, they won't be harmed in research unless they're asked to join research. And then, and then it depends on, on the type of study. So if you have research that's minimal risk, um, well, the extent of harms are minimal. So we don't have to worry about that, but uh, if they participate in research without realizing they're in research and they don't give informed consent, then uh, we say people are not being harmed, they're being wronged. When we impose people to be in research without getting their permission, we haven't really physically harmed them, but we've wronged them. So there's a difference between being wronged and harmed. And both elements are necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. And hence, a definition is to be vulnerable 
means to be exposed to the possibility of harm while substantially lacking the ability or the means to protect himself. And I want to emphasize the possibility of harm while substantially lacking. As I said before, we all have to a certain degree uh, um, some type of vulnerability. We, I mean, we don't, we're not all able to read to the same extent, to have the same intelligence to read the informed consent form. What I'm trying to say is that we all don't have perfect superior intelligence. And so we're all somewhat vulnerable uh, to being able to, to reason, but more people are more substantially lacking the ability or means to protect themselves. So what I'm trying to say, if we have a scale from zero to a hundred and zero is complete vulnerability and a hundred percent is no vulnerability, this, we're all humans. Um, and so what I'm trying to say, uh, most of the population may be on that point on the scale, but a lot of people are below that. So we're, we're concerned about people who are lack substantially the ability to protect themselves. Okay. Um, so So now getting to the reasons for vulnerability in the context of research, as I said before, we have intrinsic and situational reasons for, su for subjects unable to protect themselves. Uh, intrinsic, they lack decision-making capacity. Uh, we mentioned that. And then situational factors would include political, social, economic circumstances that may make subjects vulnerable to exploitation or undue inducement. So exploitation, one definition of exploitation is you're using people. You're taking advantage of people, okay? And, and that's due to situational factors. Uh, okay. So, what the, what's that about? All right, so uh, we went over decision-making capacity, cognitive vulnerability, economic uh, due to undue inducements, if, if that exists. Uh, but I, uh, we tend to um, claim undue inducement somewhat Readily, um, all I'm trying to say is that um, uh, it's controversial whether uh, undue inducements really exist. And as I said before, some studies show that um, uh, when uh, when people realize that they're being asked to join research and they're going to be provided with a lot of money that may make people realize they're enrolling in a, a risky study. 
However, having said that, there is uh, such a concept as desperate patients, uh, like cancer patients, or people in poverty who lack access to essential medicines. Uh, I think uh, that the concept of undue inducement may be more relevant in those situations. Uh, now, situational factors, dependent relationships, uh, power imbalances, uh, patients and physicians, parents and children, students, employees, citizens, and government. Uh, these are all, I mean, we have power imbalances uh, throughout life. And so think about this, patients and and physicians. So whenever we ask the patient to enroll in research, that's a power imbalance. And we have to be mindful of that. Uh, I think uh, yesterday we talked about whether uh, physicians should enroll their own patients, right? Uh, think about that, that a patient may be concerned about being able to say no, right, to your physician. Um, and we talked about that maybe someone else other than the um, uh, primary physician should be enrolling patients in, in their studies. Better. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Um, other situational factors: lack of freedom, prisoners uh, in the military, and communities in developing countries, and also in in developed countries. There may be minorities. Um, uh, here's the concept of medical vulnerability. Um, so the concept is that uh, potential participants in research who have serious health conditions for which there are no satisfactory treatments, uh, for example, metastatic cancer or rare disorders, uh, they maybe uh, feel like they're in very dire circumstances and it may be uh, uh, difficult. It's almost like an undue inducement. Uh, as I mentioned before, these are, could be considered desperate patients who are very eager to enroll in a study uh, that presents a new medicine for their condition. Uh, so uh, we um, uh, they may be motivated uh, to enroll at any cost. Um, and hence, uh, physicians may take advantage of that fact and they may uh, uh, exploit those individuals. Again, by um, uh, uh, misusing the information in the informed consent document. Um, and then, we have this concept of social vulnerability. So what does that mean, uh, social vulnerability? Uh, so there are uh, groups of people who belong to an undervalued or a marginalized group in our society. Uh, and as a function of social perception, uh, including stereotyping, can lead to discrimination. And again, these social perceptions of certain groups are pervasive and insidious, meaning not very um, explicit. Um, and um, those concepts could affect a person's conception of such groups, meaning that 
we may be uh, more likely to, again, take advantage of marginalized groups in, in our society. So uh, if, uh, if, if we're looking to enroll subjects in our research, we may think that uh, we would want to, uh, uh, we may find it easier to enroll marginalized group, take advantage of them. Um, and again, uh, use certain language to get them to enroll in study. So it's, it's almost similar to uh, what I mentioned the other day about drug companies. You know, 40 percent of their studies uh, are uh, enrolling people from the developing world because they may think, well, these are desperate patients, they lack access to, to health care, uh, they may not understand the language, uh, and hence it may be a lot easier to enroll people from low and middle income countries. Uh, and, and so we could think of uh, uh, those types of groups as having a social vulnerability. What I have on this slide, uh, it just, uh, when I, when I submit a protocol to my ethics committee, they ask me vulnerable populations. Will I be recruiting any of the following vulnerable populations? Select all that apply. So look at this long list. So my question to you, who's left out? <laughs> it seems like everybody in the world is vulnerable. And, mm -hmm. I, I, and it says none of these apply. I'm not sure <laughs> if, if anyone could check off that list. Uh, uh, you know, really, none of these ap apply, uh, and, uh, well, I guess, I guess they don't have lawyers on this list, um, so <laughs> me, but I would never want to do a study involving lawyers. So. Uh, Sometimes the concept of vulnerability could be too broad of a, of a concept. And we shouldn't, um, uh, again, go in, oh, here's the, um, here's the, um, oh, let me um, make this. Uh, so here, here are different um, regulations. We have the um, uh, the U.S. regulations, Helsinki, CIOMS, and they have their own list of vulnerability. Again, long list. Okay. And so the issue is um, how how broad of a concept are we talking about? Um, as I said before, all human beings are exposed to the possibility of harm, but not to the same degree. Okay, not to the same degree. So to be vulnerable means to be exposed to a significant, a significant probability of occurring an identifiable harm while substantially substantially lacking ability means to protect themselves. So uh, we, we don't want this concept to be overly broad. Uh, I mean, we do want to protect vulnerable uh, populations. So how, 
how, how do we um, protect? If, if we have the justification to enroll vulnerable people in our research, we're studying a mental illness, a childhood illness, how do we, how do we provide protections for them? An IRB is supposed to um, make sure there are protections for vulnerable people. Okay, so we've provided justification for them to be in the study, okay? So, but it doesn't end there. What kind of protection? We still want to protect them. So what kind of special justifications? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, special protections. What do you think? Um, I think before starting, uh, uh, for example, the uh, new medication uh, on the vulnerable group, we can start by testing uh, in the healthy volunteers, and that, that's one way to assess the safety. Oh, um, uh, well, I mean, we'll do that for anybody. I mean, uh, yeah. that goes without saying. Yeah, but that's the now, now we're putting them in the research study. We've done all the safety testing for anybody, right? Uh, that, that goes for all research studies. But I'm, I'm talking about special protections, additional protections for vulnerable people. What would you recommend? To make sure they're not being abused. Okay, we want to make sure they're not being abused. Okay, we're saying, okay, this is a study that needs people who are vulnerable. So how do we make sure they're not going to be used? So I we, think by uh, making sure it has been reviewed in a research ethics committee. Okay, but now, good. Where the research ethics committee? How does the research ethics committee make sure they won't be abused. Taking the informed consent from the parents is a way of protection. Uh, taking informed consent. The informed consent from, from, from the parents and the assent from the, ch the child. Okay, all right, good. So we, we make sure we get good surrogate consent either from the parents or families uh, for elderly people, mentally ill, uh, the guardians, mm -hmm. right? So we, uh, again, the Belmont report doesn't say autonomy is the principle, it's respect for persons. And we respect people by uh, getting their informed consent or surrogate consent if if they cannot give their own consent. All right, good. So that's, I mean, maybe that was pretty obvious, but we wanna make sure that we get appropriate surrogate consent. Okay, any, any other way to protect individuals? We, we should have a system for monitoring the study. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I mean, we should have that for anybody. Uh, we can engage uh, some uh, 
non-governmental organizations or other independent non other independent organization in 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 the in the research what do we do that for all studies not for all studies but for specific types of studies like what i mean is it because we're enrolling vulnerable people we want yes what Five. for for I mean, we should be, if, if, even if the people are not vulnerable, we should be monitoring the study very carefully. Uh, um, maybe by ensuring that this research cannot be done or conducted on other groups that are less vulnerable. Um, oh, okay, um, that's for sure. That's always on the table. But now we've decided it's justified to enroll individuals. So, uh, ensuring uh, maybe beneficial risk benefit ratio exists. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, we should do that for all research participants, right? However, ah, okay. Maybe the uh, last one is to make sure that the research is for that specific group benefit. Well, again, we've already given special justification to enroll uh, vulnerable groups. Okay. okay? Uh, that's, that's what I mean by special justification. We've given that justification. Now they're in the mm -hmm. research. So uh, uh, we want to give special protections. Um, and so actually what we need to do is look at the type of harms or wrongs in a research study. So as you said, we want to make sure there's a favorable risk benefit ratio. Uh, these are the type of harms in any research study, breach of confidentiality or privacy, invalid consent, lack of access to the benefit of research. So uh, uh, one could be harmed by the risk of the research. So for vulnerable people, since they're not giving their own consent, be in the study, okay? Again, we want to have the risk benefit ratio to be favorable for every in every study, right? Yeah, yeah. But because vulnerable people are not giving their own consent, we may want to have a limitation on risk. Uh, and uh, some people say recommend that uh, the risk should not be greater than minimal risk if we're doing research on vulnerable people unless there's special considerations. And we'll, we'll see that when we discuss the children regulations. The children regulations, essentially, the concept with children is that no child should be disadvantaged by being enrolled in research. So what that means is that, uh, you know, adults, they could enroll in human challenge studies, they could enroll in, in research that's greater than minimal risk, okay? Because they're giving their own informed consent. But children, uh, if, they, if there are no potential benefits directly to children, then the research can't be greater than minimal risk. If it is greater than minimal risk, then there has to be a compensating benefit. Um, so, so again, we don't want to enroll vulnerable people in risky research um, uh, unless uh, uh, unless the benefit is compensates more so than in other studies 
uh, for for the risk. Um, if uh, now this goes for all studies, but let's say if we're enrolling a, a certain stigmatized group um, or people engaging in illegal activities um, who might be considered to be more vulnerable than other people, then we may want to have stronger protections. Um, so think about this. If, um, if a breach in confidentiality will have greater risks on a vulnerable population like refugees, internally displaced people, uh, people in the military, then we may want, again, stronger confidentiality protections to protect the vulnerable people. Um, we mentioned uh, the consent process for vulnerable people. Well, we have surrogate consent. Also, um, assessing understanding. Uh, that was discussed yesterday by Maha. Uh, you know, there are certain groups like uh, we do research with people who have mild schizophrenia. Uh, they, they could give their own consent. However, we might have a concern whether they could or not. And so we may want to assess their understanding of the research. Again, this would be special uh, protection. Uh, and then um, uh, this last one, lack of access to the benefits of research. Um, people who lack access to health care, uh, if we're going to want to enroll those individuals in our research, uh, we want to make sure that that study is uniquely responsive to the healthcare needs. Uh, actually, we'll talk more about this when we talk about international research and whether one way to not to exploit people in low and middle income countries is that we want to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the research is, is unique to their needs. Uh, of course, let's say uh, we have a, a drug for hypertension. Think about this. Uh, uh, do, do we need to enroll people in poverty or could we enroll a less vulnerable um, group? So these are concept of special protection. Again, the major special protection will be surrogate consent, limitation of risk. Maybe there should be consent monitoring. Um, make sure they understand what they're getting into. Um, and uh, so, um, and we, we've been talking about this throughout this presentation um, in terms of justification. Uh, we want to essentially, the PI must convince the ethics committee that the research could not be carried out equally, equally well in a less vulnerable population. Um, and um, uh, and then this, this slide is, let me get rid of this. Um, and the research, in order to justify, we want to make sure that the knowledge will improve the diagnosis, prevention, or treatments of diseases or other health problems characteristic of that vulnerable class. Um, and so, again, I get back to the other thought that 
if we have a drug for hypertension, do we really need to enroll people who are vulnerable? Do we have to um, uh, enroll people um, in poverty who may or may not understand the research? Um, so let me, um, uh, well, let me, let me end, let me end with that. Um,